St. Margaret of Scotland. Chapter 7 Beginning a devotion to Queen Margaret as a saint, her canonization and translation, her tomb a place of pilgrimage, Cross Hill, what became of her body after the Reformation, her head preserved and sent to the Low Countries, her office inserted in the Roman breviary, changes in the day set apart for her festival. Our account of this Holy Queen's life would be manifestly incomplete without at least a short sketch of the rise and progress of the veneration in which her memory is now held, not only in Scotland, but wherever the Catholic faith is professed. We shall do our best to make it as brief and as exact as possible, premising, however, that the inquiry is beset with unusual difficulties as regards the dates of particular events. This is the first occasion on which a tolerably correct account of the subject has been gathered into one popular view. So long as we find that the soul of the Holy Queen was publicly prayed for, we may presume that the opinion of her sanctity had not yet gained ground sufficiently to warrant her being regarded as a saint in the strictest sense of the word. Now, five years after her death, we find her son Edgar founding an abbey at Coldingham for the souls of his father and of his mother and of others. Fifteen years later than that, her son David founded another abbey, also for the souls of his father and mother. Hence, whatever private and even growing opinion there may have been about her sanctity, nothing had been determined up to the date of 1113 that could authorize the omission of her name from such pious commemorations. About thirty years after her death, however, we discover the first trace of the rising feeling toward St. Margaret as a glorified saint in a grant of land to Coldingham by a nobleman who made it for the soul of King Malcolm and his deceased sons. From that time, that is, a year or two after the accession of her son David to the throne, and onwards through seceding reigns, we have tacit proofs of the same kind to show that public opinion pointed to the lamented queen as to a holy soul for whom it were henceforth superfluous to pray and for whom the honors of canonization were probably in store. All through the centuries succeeding her death, this opinion prevailed and gathered strength. Other fifty years passed, and the time was come when Rome was to be requested to set its seal on the result of public opinion. William III, a descendant of the saint, entered warmly into the cause. The abbot of Dunfermline was deputed to promote it before the Holy See. The bishops of Scotland added their unanimous testimony, and the earnest prayers of both clergy and people expressed the universal desire to see their blessed queen raised to her place among the canonized. The cause was remitted to a commission of the bishops to take evidence and to report upon it. Their hearty cooperation made this part of the process a short and an easy one, and Innocent IV, in no long time, pronounced the decree of the queen's canonization. All eyes were now turned from Rome to the stone tomb in the abbey church of Dunfermline, where the holy remains had lain for a hundred and fifty-eight years. The king was there, and his mother the dowager Queen Joan, sister of the English Henry the Third. The bishops and abbots of the kingdom were in attendance, together with the great nobility, and a numerous deputation of the clergy and the laity. The whole of the summer night, before the great day of translation, was spent by the assembled multitude in prayer for the divine blessing on the event of the next day. The 19th of June, 1251, dawned on Scotland, and an august procession passed into the abbey church. Bishops and clergy and mitred abbots were preceded by the cross and the waving censor, and were followed by the king and his court, and by a joyful multitude. Bells without and organs within the church accompanied the chanting of psalms and hymns, as the holy rite proceeded, and the bishops approached the tomb of the royal saint. It was open, and her holy body was placed with great ceremony in a chest of silver, ornamented with gold and with precious stones. The church resounded with the invocation which has never since that day altogether ceased in Scotland. St. Margaret, pray for us. It was the first public canonization that Scotland had for many previous centuries witnessed and, strange to say, it was the last. 
the honor tomb of the saint now became an object of frequent pilgrimage as devout persons approached dunfermline from the south they reached a rising ground about a mile from the ferry which they had to cross whence they gained their first view of the abbey church the goal of their journey it became a custom among them to pause here for a few minutes prayer a cross was erected on the spot and gave the little knoll the name of cross hill which it has retained even till our time the steps of the cross might have been seen a very few years ago perhaps they are still visible from the day of her translation previously to the era of the reformation two days were set apart every year to the memory of st margaret one the day of her decease november sixteenth and the other at an early period june nineteenth the day of her translation the second day however was changed to june tenth at what time or for what reason historians are at a loss to say one competent authority indeed suggests that it may have been in consequence of a second translation of the saint's head which we know was at one time separated from her body as was done with the relics of many saints when the storm of the reformation swept away so much of what the ancient christianity had taught men to revere the body of saint margaret disappeared from the church at dunfermline and the church itself became a ruin from this time we must regard the relic of the saint's head as entirely separated from her body on the unsupported authority of the scotch historian Conn, it has been alleged that the holy body of the queen together with the body of her husband was removed at the request of philip the second of spain to the royal chapel in his new palace of the escurial near madrid it is added that they were enclosed in the same chest with suitable paintings and an inscription containing their names it is sufficient to say that the late bishop gettys who spent ten years of his life in spain and was on terms of intimacy with many of the spanish court could never find any evidence of this translation of the royal bodies the head of st margaret we are able to trace with more certainty it was removed from dunfermline in the first instance to the castle of edinburgh where the unfortunate queen mary thought herself happy to possess it at the period of her flight into england the sacred head was concealed in the castle of drury by a benedictine monk of that family after thirty years it passed into the possession of the scotch fathers of the society of jesus who deputed one of their number father rob to carry it over to antwerp for greater safety its public veneration was sanctioned by the bishop in sixteen twenty three years afterwards it was removed from antwerp to the scotch college at douay at the same time under the charge of the scotch jesuits the bishop of arras in the same year publicly authorized its being treated as a true relic of the saint footnote the relic of saint margaret's head at douay has a singular history attached to it a scotch lady of the name of mowbray presented the college with a rich silver bust larger than life and profusely ornamented with jewels as a reliquary to contain the head of the saint during the commonwealth in england the sons of charles i and their exile visited douay and asked to be shown the relic of their illustrious ancestress nearly a century later when the jesuits were driven from france seventeen sixty five the reliquary disappeared from the scotch college at douay and has never since been traced the sacred relic however was not removed it still adorned the college under the government of scotch secular priests until the great revolution laid the religion of france in ruins seventeen ninety three the superiors before their hurried departure from douay buried the head in their garden hoping at some future day to return and claim it but when the college was again visited by the scotch no trace of their valued relic could be found End of footnote. Meanwhile, the Scottish refugees at Rome were not idle in promoting the honor of St. Margaret, especially among their Catholic countrymen. Innocent X, 1645, first granted a plenary indulgence to the faithful on St. Margaret's Day, which was then kept on the 10th of June. The office and mass of St. Margaret had been confined up to this time to the limits of her own kingdom in 1673 her office was inserted by clement x in the roman breviary june tenth as a semi-double festival with the option to all clergymen not scotchmen 
to say the ferial office on the day if they preferred it the saint was at the same time declared to be patroness of scotland second in order to saint andrew the apostle and her festival was appointed to be kept in scotland as a double of the second class the pope granted this extension of the saint's office to the petition of father aloysius leslie the jesuit rector of the scotch college in rome in conjunction with the agent of the scotch missionaries and with the baron menzies of pitfidels who at that time represented the duke of moscovy at the court of rome soon afterwards and probably with a view to making the virtues of the holy queen better and more generally known father leslie published a short history of her life in the italian language the experience of a few years was sufficient to show that some inconvenience attached to the celebration of st margaret's day on the tenth of june owing to the frequent concurrence of some of the later movable festivals on the same day innocent the eleventh therefore transferred it to the eighth of july sixteen seventy eight another and a final change in the day was made by innocent the twelfth sixteen ninety three at the instance of the unhappy james the second of england and his consort who petitioned his holiness to restore the saint's day to the tenth of june the birthday of their no less unfortunate son afterwards called by his adherents james the third of england the pope at the same time renewed a decree of sixteen ninety one which had made the festival of st margaret no longer optional to the whole church but is henceforth of precept thus the final crown was placed on the devotion which for nearly six centuries had been gradually gathering round the scottish queen